Hallelujah. Mm, y'all might be late for lunch. Ooh, after that, my Lord. Breathe with me. Count of three. We're just going to take a deep breath in. One, two, three. Deep breath in. Now. Deep breath in. And now. Deep breath in and hold it. And slowly out. And find a good rhythm of your breathing right now. Because I want to share with you a couple of ideas um, that come up in spiritual direction sessions that I do with a bunch of people all over the country. And I want to hit you with two of them right off the top, okay? The first one is a question. And the question is this. What stories are you believing about yourself these days? It's an important question because the stories that you are believing about yourself these days determine how you see yourself, how you see your world, how you show up in your world. What stories are you believing about yourself these days? It's really a question about identity. It's a question about the direction your life will ultimately take. It's a question about the capacity of your sacred imagination. Now, this leads me to the next point, which is this. Maybe hell isn't for the sinful, but the unimaginative. Now, I, I, I'm not asking you to bet no whole lot, but a bunch of money on it. But it, 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 it bears consideration, doesn't it? Maybe, maybe hell is not reserved for the sinful, but the unimaginative. Maybe hell, this eternal torturous state of disconnection with God, isn't for the sinful, but for those who can't imagine themselves being anything more than what, they, what is immediately evident about themselves. People who can't imagine that there is an eternal, holy, loving God, who can't imagine that there is an eternal, loving, and holy God who actually loves them. I'm talking about people who can't imagine that they're any more than just body, bone, flesh, and breath. People who can't imagine that they can become more than what is particularly true about themselves. They can't believe they can trans transcend the particularities such as gender, race, ethnicity, and nationality to become their God-determined self. Spiritual beings who can resemble Jesus. They can't imagine themselves showing up as people of justice, wisdom, mercy, sacrifice, faithfulness, and love. All these attributes and more embodied in Jesus Christ. And because they can't imagine themselves like Jesus, they naturally fall into behaviors that are destructive to themselves and other people. Behaviors that the Bible calls sin. Maybe, just maybe, hell isn't reserved for the sinful, but the unimaginative. It's a dynamic we see in play in the Old Testament in the story of Moses and the children of Israel. God cast a vision for Moses and the children of Israel of who they could truly become. God tells Moses, Moses, you are more than just some disgraced adopted son of Pharaoh turned shepherd. You are a liberator of a people, a people who are more than just Egyptian slaves. God cast a vision for Moses and the children of Israel that they would be his covenant people. People wrapped up 
in the bonds of intimacy with God in the tethers of a shared vow. But Moses wrestled with imagining himself as more. He immediately starts offering details about his particularities. Who am I that they would listen to me? I've never been eloquent. I'm slow of tongue. But in the presence of God, Moses is transformed. In the presence of God's glory, this weighted, concentrated experiencing of God's excellence that shines, shines from the burning bush, shines from the top of Mount Sinai. God's glory progressively transforms Moses into who God has determined him to be. And Moses leads his people to freedom and moves them into deeper relationship with God. But they were people who wrestled with imagining themselves as even more. So they naturally fall into behaviors that are not worthy. Their minds, conditioned by their oppression, see themselves as only body, thought, emotion, and need. So they sought the kind of comfort that they saw the Egyptians enjoying. They, they saw, saw the, the, sought the kind of significance and power and control the Egyptians had and found themselves fashioning idols that affirmed who they were and not worshiping the one true God who would fashion them into what he decides them to be. Breaking vows, they didn't have the power to keep. And like scattered pieces of the broken tablets at the feet of Moses, the children of Israel's relationship with God lay broken before them. But Moses picks up the pieces, right? Picks up the pieces and returns to the presence of God in the presence of God's glory to reaffirm their broken relationship with God. And God's glory continues the transformation process of Moses to such a degree that Exodus 34 and 29 says, the skin of Moses' face shone with the glory of God. Now, I bring this up, this story about Moses and the children of Israel as the covenant people because Paul alludes to this in 2 Corinthians 3. 7 and 18. As Paul attempts to stretch the sacred imagination of these people in Corinth to become more like their God-determined selves, he alludes to this moment found in the book of Exodus. Let me read this passage for you. It's found in 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 18. Now. When? Now. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in the letters of stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, would not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison to the surpassing glory. Somebody say surpassing glory. And yes, and if what was transitory came with glory, how much more greatness is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull for to this day. The same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns... To the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image in ever-increasing glory, from glory unto glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Yeah, we can praise God for that. Time is pressing in on us. And it always does. Did you hear? 
This may be the last year for daylight savings time. This might be the last year we got to fall back an hour or spring forward an hour. Two months ago, the uh, Senate uh, passed legislation that would make daylight savings time permanent in 2023. And I could never tell which was worse, like falling back or springing forward, right? All I know, it just felt like time pushing in on us and us having to make that adjustment over the two or three weeks. But time presses in on us, right? It always does. Whether from behind us or before us, undressed trauma and pain from our past seems to push into our presence. Hopes and happenings of the future seem to press in on our presence. And in the text, the Apostle Paul here is feeling the press of time. Paul's ministry, the way he sees his existence is one impacted by a new covenant age, pressing, pressing, pressing in from the future into his present existence. He was a minister. His ministry, it was impacted by this powerful, inevitable time where Jesus returns in all power, making all things right and inviting all of humanity into deeper intimacy. Family, there is a new reality with a new covenant relationship that will create a brand new kind of people and it's pressing in on Paul. There is a new covenant age that is so powerful and inevitable that it's beautiful. It's so beautiful, it's glorious. It shines with greater glory that burns brighter than the fire in the burning bush, shines brighter than the fire and thunder and cloud in the top of Mount Sinai. It is the new glorious covenant age and it's pushing in on the old age. And when it comes, that it shines, the world and God's people will be changed forever. Can you Imagine that. Because there were people in Corinth who couldn't. And because they could not imagine it, they could not be changed by it. They were holding on with a death grip to old ways of thinking and old ways of being, ways in thinking and being that put their trust in the social norm, in temporary comfort, in temporary power, in temporary control, in temporary significance. To such a degree, it made the Apostle Paul look a little foolish. But all this talk about humility and suffering and ugh, poverty. To such a degree that they began to question his competency as a minister. But Paul suggested chapter 3 is, well, yeah, if you're looking for a minister that, that's into the old ways of thinking and old ways of being, I might not be the one. Because like last night we learned we have been made competent as ministers of a new covenant. A new covenant age that is coming and is already pressing in on us. See, Paul knew the signs of the new covenant age. Paul saw the signs of this new covenant age, and the sign was this, the transformation of the human heart. God's intent was for people to no longer solely focus their attention on the externals. God's intent was for people to no longer solely focus their attention on external laws and rules to be kept by their own energy, by their own tenacity, by their own fortitude. But God would bring, would come and implant vows inside all of our hearts. Chris shared this, uh, this idea with you last night, the law written on the heart of humans. That there would be some kind of interior transformation where intimacy with God transforms our thoughts, our feelings, our values, and our desires, making us a brand new kind of people, a covenant people, a community motivated to love by love, uh, that live sustainable lives, who see ourselves and others in new ways, who no longer react, but respond and respond as people who are eternal. And family, it is life. Can you imagine that? Because that's vastly different than the old covenant. So different that Paul would say, while the spirit gives life, the letter kills. Now, several years ago, uh, I got a visit from a guy uh, from another church um, in the small town where I was working. He attended a very hard line church of Christ it was conservative to the extreme, strong on the word, hard on sin, and even hard on their people. I see you know that church. 
Now, the church where I, I, I was working, they, we were considered the progressive church. We really weren't, but in comparison, you know, we were. This was a time when if you talked about grace a little bit too much and had a kitchen as a church of Christ, you were a heretic, right? <laughs> but he came to my office for some, some, some pastoral care, and he, he came with a lot of trepidation. He literally walked into my office looking around to make sure nobody saw him. I'm like, it's just me. And literally, he said, promise me you'll let nobody know that I saw you. I was like, yeah, cool, dude. And I started asking him about his life. And he started telling me these off, this awful sin that had captured him. And, 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 and I had to ask him, I was like, dude, how, how did you get there going to a church that talks so much about sin and what's right and what's wrong and doing right and just forcing yourself into it? And he told me the mountain of perfection placed in front of him was just so high, there was no way he could, in his own power, he could climb it on his own. So it was easier to fall down than to climb up. And that passage in Romans 7 came to my mind. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin seized the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment, put me to death. The letter kills. But the Spirit gives life because while the rules, the law, the old covenant highlights right and wrong, it didn't come with the power to do anything about it. Oh, but the new covenant age that's pressing in on us, gives us the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that? The very Spirit of God taking up residence inside of us, giving us the ability to progressively become the kind of people that more times than not respond like Jesus, who naturally respond like Jesus. The Holy Spirit in us gives us the ability to be faithful to the vows we've made to God, an ability called righteousness. Righteousness is a gift God gives us, and we work on it as well, but it gives us the ability to honor the vows we've made with God, vows to worship God and love one another. This is one of the distinctions Paul is attempting to clarify for the church in Corinth. The old law, the old covenant isn't bad. It just doesn't come with the power to do anything. The, 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 it shines. It, it, it's not bad. It has a shine to it. It has a glory to it. It's just the new way of thinking and being of the new covenant comes with the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, to help them understand the difference, Paul talks about the moment Moses comes down with his face shining from spending time in the presence of God. And in the Exodus story, when Moses came down with his face shining, people started freaking out. Moses' face reflecting the, the glory of God worried them. So to relieve their fears, Moses would cover his face with a veil. And Paul used the story of Moses covering his face with a veil to suggest that the veil was used to hide the fact that gradually the shine on Moses' face would fade, just like the importance of the old law would fade in light of the new covenant age that shines much brighter. Can you imagine that? And when you turn to, towards the Lord, the veil gets lifted and a number of amazing things happen. First, when anyone turns to the Lord, commits their life to God, the veil is lifted and they begin to see Jesus everywhere in the Old Testament. When the veil is lifted, you start to see Jesus is the word that spoke worlds into being and puts planets in their spinning. You start seeing Jesus was the model of Melchizedek, the king of peace, and the prince from another order. It was Jesus. Jesus was the angel of the Lord who visited Abraham and Sarah. He was he saw Hagar and her son and cared for them in the wilderness. Jesus was the angel of the Lord who wrestled with Jacob and gave him a limp and a new name. It's Jesus, the fire that burned the bush but didn't consume it. It was Jesus the love behind every vow and commandment that God made with man. It was Jesus who's Moses model as a savior coming out of water and out of Egypt. Jesus was the rock in the wilderness that Moses struck that provided water in their wandering. It was Jesus, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of cloud by night. It was Jesus, the music that came from David's Psalms, the wisdom that came from Solomon's words, who was even a shine in Samson's long and luxurious hair. It was Jesus 
who the prophets proclaim as the Messiah who's pressing into our reality to redeem all things and reconcile all things and restore all things. Can you imagine that? It was Jesus. The very moment you turn towards Jesus, the veil is lifted and you start seeing Jesus everywhere in Torah and the Hebrew Bible. Or as Paul would say it in verse 15, even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, a veil is taken away. You start seeing Jesus everywhere in the Old Testament. And you start seeing Jesus everywhere in your life. In the promise and in the pain. In the sun that shines, in the, the breeze that comforts, in the passing smile of children, in the practice of gathered people, in those moments when an overwhelming sense of peace falls all over you, when the worst is all around you, when the veil is lifted, you begin seeing Jesus show up in the word and in your world. And the second thing that Paul suggests happens when you turn to the Lord and the veil is lifted, we experience a glory that transforms Paul would say it this way in verse 18, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. We are transformed from glory unto glory. Can you imagine? There is an eschatological glory from God pressing into us that shines from God's moral excellence, that shines from God's goodness, that shines from God's holiness, from God's mercy, grace, wisdom, power, and faithfulness and love. And we encounter that glory when we study God's word, yes, we do. as we pray, as we care for the least of these, as we break bread together in our baptism, in divine encounter, through Christian practices, we contemplate the glory and we are glorified. We are divinized. We are swept in a continual process of becoming a reflection of Jesus. Can you imagine that? And it is a glory that always transforms, and it is a glory that will never fade. Like, for real, can you imagine that? Would you be willing to put your confidence and trust in that vision of you? Would you be willing to believe that story about yourself? I, I think much like how Paul talks about the old covenant as good but temporary, we should think of ourselves in the same way. Our particularities, who we are on the circumference of ourselves, is good. Our gender, race. Ethnicity, nationality, those sorts of things, they're good. We should celebrate those things. We should have a rich appreciation for who we are, where we're from, and where we live. There is something good about all of those things. Men, there is something good about being men. Don't let anybody tell you it's not. Amen. Women, there is something extraordinary about you all being women. And don't let anybody tell you different. There's something good about being from someplace and living somewhere. All those things, if held in a healthy way, can be empowering. Matter of fact, Jesus incarnating as a human being in a particular time, in a particular place, gives greater dignity to our particularities. Not only does Jesus' incarnation give greater dignity to the particularities, but God fashions a way to use those particularities for our shaping and formation. We are formed and shaped in the likeness of Christ, not despite, but through the particularities of gender, race, ethnicity, and nationality. My spiritual journey is informed by my particularities. Your spiritual journey is informed by your particularities. Jesus brings greater dignity as well as functionality to the particularities. There's some glory in it, but... We must never forget that these particularities of gender, race, ethnicity, and nationality are only temporary. Here's my fear. My fear is this, that we, there has been a theft of our sacred imagination. We can no longer conceive of living into the part of ourselves that is sacred and inextricably connected to God leaving us enthralled and engrossed in our particularities, holding so tight to them that they have often become toxic. 
We hold on to gender, race, ethnicity, nationality, that they cease to hold dignity nor serve the function of formation. Our sacred imagination with its affections towards Christ have been atrophied to the point that we cannot imagine. Galatians 3, 27, it says, For all of you who are baptized into Christ have closed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave or free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Did it say all? All? All uh, okay, it's in my translation too. <laughs> <laughs> Breathe with me one more time. Because I need for you to hear this. We become what we worship. And just like the children of Israel needed an idol that affirmed what they wanted, Western evangelism, evangelicalism has done the same to Jesus. There's a need for an exclusive Jesus because that's the desired social norm. There's a need for, for, for a wealthy and powerful Jesus because that's the desired social norm. Now, nobody's listening to me no more. There's a need for a militaristic Jesus because that's the desired social norm. There's a need for an overly masculine Jesus because that's the desired social norm. We become what we worship and we worship what we become. We have held so tight to our particularities that we lost sight of our inherent sacrality. So the only thing left to do is form a Jesus instead of going through the process of being formed into Jesus. Amen. Oh, but to worship the Jesus of the Bible whose intent is to transform us and the social norm, the, that, that turn the other cheek Jesus, that eat with sinners and tax collectors Jesus, that relinquishing power Jesus, that not my will but yours be done Jesus, that forgive the Father for they know not what they do type Jesus, that stepping out of an open grave type Jesus, that sitting at the right hand of God Jesus, interceding for the world Jesus, that one day coming again and reconciling all things Jesus, to worship that Jesus is to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus and eternity stops being a future hope but a very present reality <laughs> ministers can you imagine that <laughs> shepherds can you imagine that the bride of Christ, the church of the living God. Can you imagine that? Amen. I pray that you can because this is the story you should be believing about yourselves. Can you imagine it? Let's pray. Great God in heaven, we worship you. We adore you. You are worthy, God. You are a powerful God. You are a God that shows up. You are a God that transforms and makes us better than we ever imagined we can be. You set us on higher ground, dear God. You meet us in our lament. You sit with us in our suffering, and you use that incredibly, miraculously to, to transform us into the likeness of your dear son so that we can stand up when our haunch is hurt. We can walk out of these tombs, and we can love a world that is obsessed with their own death and we can offer them life not through our own power, dear God, not through our own strength, but through the Holy Spirit that you gifted us within ourselves. And when all is said and done, dear God, we promise to give you all the glory because you're just so worthy to be praised. Oh, shape our social imagination, shape our sacred imagination, not just for our growth, but for your glory. Amen, in Jesus' name.